Good morning, Sanctus Church. So glad you can join us this morning as we continue our series on the book of Romans. Pastor John has beautifully articulated God's word with clarity and guided us through with some very difficult passages in Romans 1 and 2. I hope you've been profoundly impacted and challenged to see ourselves differently in the light of God's glory and grace. Well, the last part of Romans 1, Paul is writing about the sins of the world and the gravity of God's wrath on sin, especially for those who do not know Christ or choose to reject him in order to worship themselves through idolatry, humanism, secularism, and hedonism. Well, the last part of Romans chapter 2 turns us from looking around us to looking directly within us. What we will explore today has the potential to be life-changing if we are seriously applying what we hear this morning. Now, the theme of Romans 2, verses 17 to 29, is the struggle of every Christ follower, if not surrendered to Jesus, has the potential to derail our effectiveness to lead people to Jesus and sabotage our marriages, parenting styles, and even our friendships. So let's begin with prayer this morning. God, we just thank you for your word. And Lord, as we dig into your word, let your word dig deep into our lives. Lord, I pray that you would reveal who we are in the light of your love and of your grace. Empower us, Holy Spirit, to not just hear, but to live what we hear today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me begin by sharing a story. There were two brothers, and they were notorious around the town for being crooked businessmen. And they used unethical practices to steal money from others. And suddenly, one of the brothers died. The surviving brother found himself in search of a minister who would be willing to give his brother a good funeral. So he finally made an offer to a minister that was very hard for him to refuse. He said, I'll pay you a great sum. And he said, if you will just do me one favor. In eulogizing my brother, I want you to call him a saint. And if you do, I will give you a handsome reward. The minister, a shrewd pragmatist, agreed to comply. He said, why not? The money could be used to help put a new roof on the church. So when the funeral service began, the auditorium was filled with all the important business associates who had actually been swindled through the years by these two brothers. Unaware of the deal that had been made for the eulogy, they were expecting to be vindicated by the public exposure of this man's character by the minister. At last, the much-awaited moment arrived, and the minister spoke. And he said, the man you see in the coffin was a vile and hateful individual. He was a liar, a thief, a deceiver, a manipulator, a reprobate, an adulterer, and a hedonist. He destroyed the fortunes and careers and the lives of countless people and families in the city, and some of whom are here today. This man did every dirty, rotten, unconscionable thing you can think of. But compared to his brother who is here He was a saint. Now we may chuckle at that and, and, and smile and laugh at that moment, but very often we try to live as someone we're really not. And at some point, our true self will be revealed. Our pride and our hypocrisy will be exposed. Nathaniel Hawthorne once wrote, No man for any considerable period can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which may be the true. So this morning, we're going to look at the area of pride and hypocrisy. Now, let me be upfront. In the course of my own ministry, I had to confront this reality in my life and had to make some very painful and hard decisions to change my own life. It's a constant battle I face, so I share this sermon as a person living through what I'm preaching. The book of Romans was a letter written by Paul to the church in Rome. The church had had existed during the time of Emperor Nero, mostly consisting of Gentiles. But there were also uh, many Jewish Christians in the congregation as well. Now in this passage in Romans 2, verses 17 to 29, Paul is addressing an issue that had to do with the Jews, but also translates to us today very well. To better understand this passage, we need to actually go back in history to around 1446 BC, around the time of the Exodus. Moses, the promised deliverer, led the Israelites out of slavery into Egypt in search for the promised land in Canaan. Now, it had been about three months since they left Egypt, and they were camped in the desert in front of Mount Sinai when God spoke to Moses and said, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations 
you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And that's found in Exodus 1 verses 5 to 6. Now, wow, this is an amazing promise. The precious privilege God graciously gave to the Israelites. One moment they were nothing but slaves in Egypt. And the next moment they were God's treasured possession. Out of all the nations of the earth. Absolutely remarkable. Now to show his love and commitment, God went before them as a pillar of cloud during the day to shade them from the hot desert sun and a pillar of fire at night to keep them warm during the cold desert night. It was a sign that his presence was with them and would go before them. Not only that, Israel was the only nation on earth that God gave special revelation to. God's word protected his people, gave them wisdom and marked them as unique people in the world. God's dietary laws protected his people physically from eating hazardous foods. God's moral law protected his people from harmful spiritual influences. Now having God's law was a privilege. And if they obeyed it completely, then they would have continued to receive the blessings as God's treasured possessions. Now initially, the Israelites were humble, grateful, and thankful for God's love and provision. But that lasted literally a week. And they soon began to grumble and complain with a sense of entitlement. Does that sound familiar? You and I often fall into a similar trap, I'm sure. Israel did their best to obey God's commands. But over time, pride crept into their hearts because they, uh, because of, they felt they were God's chosen people and were the only ones to know God's law. Eventually, they began to be proud of their ability not only to know the law, but to obey the law. And so Paul writes the letter to address the cultural pride and expose their hypocrisy. So now let's take a a closer look, beginning at verse 17 to 21. He reads, now if you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, and if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Now these verses describe that people developed a superiority uh, complex. They thought that they were privileged insiders of God's revelation, the only ones with the truth. They were even convinced themselves that they were the only ones qualified to lead and guide others because they were the only enlightened ones. They thought of themselves so highly because they entrusted, they were entrusted with the law and the truth, and they thought others were fools. The sad thing was, it was kind of true. They were really God's chosen people. And he hoped that his law would go out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, as we read in Isaiah 2, 3. God hoped that his people would bring the knowledge and love of God to the entire world. That they would be mature and grow up to be his ambassadors and representatives, be his hands and his feet on earth. God hoped his people would have his heart and be a royal priesthood, a holy nation that would declare the praises of God who called them out of darkness into his wonderful light. To be shepherds and guides for the lost people from all nations. Unfortunately, their calling got to their heads Instead of being full of love and humility and grace for others, they became puffed up with pride, arrogance, and they started looking down condescendingly on others. They were supposed to be priests to the world, but they didn't reach out with compassion, but actually desired to rule over others. God's word and law was given to establish a covenant relationship with them to discover the will of God. However, the Jews exalted themselves because of their knowledge of the law. Their pride was bad enough, but what was even worse was their hypocrisy. Because they didn't obey God's law when they taught it to others, they themselves didn't keep what they spoke. Let's take a look at verse 21 to 23. It says, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? You see, the Jews felt proud to teach others, but they didn't listen to their own teaching. Paul highlights that they would preach about the sin of stealing, 
yet they would steal from others. Or they would teach about the sin of adultery only to commit it themselves. They, they taught against idolatry and idols, but they would go and rob idols from pagan temples only to melt them down to have the gold for themselves. They essentially became the biggest hypocrites of their time. When their hypocrisy was exposed, it resulted in God's name being dishonored and blasphemed. Do you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? A very interesting point to note in the story is that the priests and the Levites were leaving Jerusalem and could not excuse that they did not want to touch the man who had been unclean for worship. Why? Because they had already accomplished their duties and were heading home. In fact, the story shows their hypocrisy. They had just been to worship God or to love God, but did not help the wounded man or show their love for their neighbor. Their refusal to love their neighbor cast doubt on their love for God. The priest was an expert in the law and undoubtedly knew of the laws like those found in Exodus 23, 4 and 5, which commanded that we are to help our enemy's donkey if he was lost or overburdened. The priest was unwilling to help even a human in distress. And remember, this was a Jewish victim on the road. Many Jews define their neighbor as only someone who is a Jew. Then you have the Levite who was also from the tribe responsible for spiritual leadership of the nation. He also knew the law and what was required of him. But what did he do? And what did they both do? They both ignored the wounded man lying on the road. And these represent people caught up in lifeless religion. They play religious games at worship, but it does not affect the way they live. So now let's look at verse 24. It says, As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because you, instead of becoming God's loving hands to the world, in the end their actions actually brought dishonor to God. The exact opposite of what God planned. Maybe they thought that no one would discover their hypocrisy. But we can't keep hypocrisy hidden because it eventually will be discovered. You know, the story is told of, uh, of a zoo that was noted for their great collection of different animals. One day, the gorilla died. And so to keep up the appearance of a full range of animals, the zookeeper hired a man to wear a gorilla suit and fill uh, fill in for this dead animal. It was his first day on the job, and the man didn't know how to act like a gorilla very well. So as he tried to move convincingly, he got too close to the wall of the enclosure and tripped and fell into the lion exhibit. And he began to scream, and he was convinced his life was over because the lion was about to attack him and kill him. Until the lion spoke to him and said, Be quiet, you're going to get both of us fired. Now, again, we can laugh and think about that, but we can only keep up the act for a certain period of time. The word hypocrite is actually from the Greek, which literally means actor or play acting. Now, in those days, there were theaters where people would play parts behind a mask. And so at some point, you know, they would go and stand and the mask would be in front of them and they would act with this mask in front of their face. And so that's when Jesus uses the word hypocrite to symbolize people living behind a mask. But the truth is, at some point in time, our mask will fall off. And Paul pointed out that their hypocrisy not only dishonored God, but also caused the Gentiles to blaspheme God. The Gentiles may have concluded, why should we honor God when his chosen people don't even obey him? Now, from this passage in Romans, it's easy for us to condemn the Jews. But if we're honest and look at our own lives as Christians, all of us fall constantly to the trap of hypocrisy. I know I certainly do. Today, one of the most common excuses given by people for not following Jesus or even going to church is that the church is full of hypocrites. And most often, they're right. Whether we like it or not, we as Christians have been stereotyped as bigoted, critical, and self-righteous hypocrites. Brennan Manning says, The single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him with their lifestyle. And that is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. So when you hear someone say, Christians are the biggest group of hypocrites on the planet, our response should be like, yes we are. But I thank God for his wonderful mercy and grace for forgiveness. However, so often our immediate response is to deny, deflect, or cover it up. So let's be real. Let's be honest. See, the Jews thought that they were righteous simply 
because of their heritage and ancestry. Paul pointed out that it was wrong to think like that. We do not become Christians because we were born in a Christian home or because we come to church. The righteousness we receive is through faith we have in the finished work of Christ. Now let's look at verse 25 and 27 where Paul writes, Circumcision has value if we observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a lawbreaker. You see, some of the Jews depended on circumcision and others on rituals to find their identity and righteousness. However, Paul taught that circumcision and obedience to the law and all the rituals have value and impact when it's accompanied by heartfelt obedience. You see, in the Christian world, we can apply the same principle to baptism and communion. They were instituted by Jesus for our benefit, yet they only have value and impact when done with faith and a commitment to love and honor Christ. There's always a temptation to substitute outward actions for real heart change. We're often tempted to make ourselves look good and and look spiritual before people. But God sees our hearts. Now let's read verses 28 and 29. It says, A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is the circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. You see, God's concern is with our hearts more than our outward appearance and rituals. He longs for real relationship with us, not with the appearance of religious rituals. The problem is because we seek the praise from people and not the approval of God. God wants to give us a new heart. As he writes in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Dr. Christian Bernard, the first surgeon ever to do a heart transplant, impulsively asked one of his patients, Dr. Philip Blayberg, who was the second person to receive a transplant? He asked this question. Would you like to see your old heart? At 8 p.m. on a subsequent evening, this man stood in a room in Johannesburg, South Africa, where Dr. Bernard went up to the cupboard, took down a glass container, and handed it to Dr. Blayberg. Inside the container was his old heart. For a moment, he stood there, stunned into silence, the first person in history to ever hold his own heart in his hands. Finally, he spoke and for 10 minutes asked Dr. Bernard with technical questions and inquired of him. And then he turned to take the final look at the contents of the glass container and said, so this is my old heart that caused me so much trouble. He handed it back and turned away and left it forever. You know, this is what God does with our spiritual heart when we become Christians. We have the same body but our hearts become radically new. Our old hearts gave us so much trouble. The difference with a physical heart change and a spiritual heart change is that you will still eventually die if you receive a new physical heart. Blaber, he died 594 days later. But those who are with a new heart, who are new creations in Christ, will never die. Those of us who've received a spiritual new heart has the guarantee, as Jesus said, those who believe in me will never die. You see, the main reason why we should want to obey God is not because we want to be blessed or to get something from Him, but rather to honor and glorify Him. We should fear the sin of pride and hypocrisy because it puts a veneer of godliness over our disobedient heart that ultimately dishonors the glorious and gracious God who loved us and saved us from death and hell. Mark Twain once said, We're all like the moon. We have a dark side we don't want anyone to see. Very often we act and put up a veneer to cover something we don't want people to know about us or see in us. We're driven by shame to cover, to hide. But we forget. God sees. God knows 
And the amazing thing is that God still loves us even in our ugliness. Hypocrisy can be illustrated by the way we clean our homes when company's coming. You know, when people come over, we shove the junk in the closet, stuff it under the bed, you know, where it can't be seen. Out of sight, out of mind, it doesn't exist as long as our guests don't see it. Now, this is not a horrible way to clean a house, but it's definitely a terrible way to deal with the spiritual junk. Throughout the book of Romans, we will find that God is looking for obedience that springs from love and a desire and a passion, not out of compliance or duty or obligation. He's interested in heart-based obedience. Parenting is similar. You know, when our kids are young and unable to reason well, we focus more heavily on external obedience. Rules help guide behavior. But as our children grow, we transition from an externally focused emphasis to an internal heart-based obedience. You see, self-deception is always hard to overcome. So how do we overcome the deception of hypocrisy? C.S. Lewis once wrote, he said, Humans are very seldom either totally sincere or totally hypocritical. Their moods change, their motives are mixed, and they often find themselves quite mistaken as to what their motives are. I'd like to demonstrate that through this sermon demonstration. I have here an orange. This orange has a beautiful look with the skin around it. It can speak of someone who has this external veneer of religion and trying to look good before people. And so I'm going to drop this this orange here in this container full of water. What happens to this orange that is unpeeled, it stays on the top. And this, these jars can speak about our relationship to Jesus. And we want to have a relationship that has depth. And very often we live a very superficial Christian life because we live with the veneer of our external habits, external things that we do to look very religious. But I also have here an orange that is peeled. When we remove this external veneer, remove and get to who we really are, being real with God, being sincere, opening our hearts to who we are before people and before our Savior. Now, if I drop this peeled orange, we can see that the orange sinks deep to the bottom. And it can show to us the life of a person that removes the veneer, removes that shiny look from the outside, that we have everything together and that everything is fine. And when we remove that, we can actually develop a deep, relationship to Christ, that we can come before him in honesty and brokenness, and our relationship can be strong and genuine and sincere. So the question for you is, what type of Christian faith and Christian lifestyle do you want to live? Do you want to live with superficiality that the depth of our relationship is not there, or that we're open and honest, and that we can have a deep and abiding relationship with Christ? You see, there's no simple formula or quick remedy or even a phrase that will automatically remove hypocrisy and pride. But I'd like to give you some helpful action points that we can take from this sermon today. And so there are three I'd like to point out. The first is to fight daily to maintain reality with God on the heart level. And the key word is reality or being real. Meet God in the word, reading his word, reading the Bible and in prayer. Not to check off a to-do list or that we've just had our quiet time. Rather, we come before God to expose everything in our hearts to Him. To confess our sins and our struggles. To seek His strength and power to overcome. Now, it's also good to have people in our lives who we can be real with. That can also speak into our lives to hold us accountable. So ask yourself, who are they? The second, cultivate honesty and humility toward others. Paul writes in Philippians 2, 3 that we should esteem and value others above ourselves. Don't impress others with godliness and strength and gifts and abilities. Let people know that we're weak and it is only by the grace of God we live. And finally, the third is to learn to be doers of God's word. When we read and meditate the scriptures, let's not let our eyes just glance the words But rather let the words penetrate into our mindset, breaking any strongholds and allowing the Holy Spirit to move our hearts into action. Ask the question, how am I supposed to live in the light of this text? 
Don't let the sin of hypocrisy deceive us or damage non-Christians or dishonor our glorious God. Remember, the issue that Paul is addressing is the false pretense that people had in their racial or religious status, made, which made them feel superior. That the external was enough that they felt. But Paul emphasized again what Christ emphasized in Matthew 15, verse 8, he, where he said, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So knowing what Paul is putting forth, we can conclude that righteousness is not um, achieved through external considerations like race and religion, the color of our skin, the family we grew up in, uh, the things you do. None of those things give us merit or right standing with God. So the, the real truth is we need to rest in the truth that God is at work in us. And what matters most is heart change. God is at work in you and in me to change our focus from outward, what people see, to inward, what God knows. To exchange our hypocritical show of obedience for an inward motivation of love to draw closer to Him. You see, inward faithfulness will lead to outward faithfulness. Outward change may not lead to inward change, but inward change will definitely lead to outward change. Let God change us from the inside and then live faithfully from the inside out. I share the story of uh, some parents on the East Coast who one day got a phone call from their son during the Korean War. And they were thrilled because they hadn't heard from him for many months. And he said to them that he was in San Francisco on his way home. He said, Mom, I just want to let you know that I'm bringing a buddy home with me. He got hurt pretty bad. He only, was, you know, he only has one eye, one arm, and one leg. I'd sure like him to live with us, he told his mom. And you know, his mom replied and said, sure, son. He sounds like a brave man. We can find a room for him for a while. Mom, you don't understand, he said. I want for him to come and live with us. His mom replied, well, okay. Uh, you know, we can try it for six months or so. He said, no, mom. I want him to stay always with us. He needs us. He's only got one eye, one arm, and one leg. And he's in really bad shape. Now, by now, the mother had lost her patience. And he said, son, you're being unrealistic about this. You're emotional because you've been in a war. That boy will be a drag on you and a constant problem for all of us. Be reasonable. Well, the phone clicked dead. The next day, the parents got a telegram. In that telegram, it said their son had committed suicide. A week later, the parents received the body. They looked down with unspeakable sorrow on the corpse of their son, who had one eye, one arm, and one leg. You see, how do we treat those around us? Do we inevitably seek to have an appearance that we don't want anyone to encumber in our life and be a hindrance to us? We want to keep an image to people Do we authentically love people, regardless of who they are, regardless of their status, regardless of their circumstance? Are we willing to be vulnerable and accepting and loving of people, regardless of who they are? And that is what Paul wants us, what that is writing towards. And that's what God wants us to be people who live authentically to this world. A world that is looking to reject Christ, that is dishonoring of God. But when they see us living the reflection of Jesus. By this, all will know that we are his disciples by the love we have for one another. You know, a year before my father passed away, he sent me a booklet about hypocrisy. It was actually called The Pharisee and Me. You know, I was grateful at the moment for it, and I I kept it in my briefcase at the time. Many years later, after my father passed away, when I was facing a very critical period in my life, when I had to make some serious decisions that would determine the direction of my life, I wonder what my father would have said and guided me in that moment. It was then, in God's kindness, he reminded me of that booklet he sent me many years back. And it was like God was speaking to me through him. And I realized that in that moment in time, I was living very hypocritically. And I needed to make changes in my life. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt that my dad would have encouraged me to make decisions in life not to live hypocritically, but to live genuinely. And even though the decisions I took after reading that booklet were 
hard and were some of the most painful I've ever made. I knew that if my dad was alive, he would have, he would have said, Son, go do it. Live sincerely and God will be with you. And today, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, they were some of the best decisions I made in my life. Friends, whatever state you are in today, make the choices in life that will lead you away from hypocrisy towards being genuine and sincere and real before God and others. You know, as the song says, when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come, you search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. And so this morning as we conclude, would you join with me in praying a prayer to God? The the prayer will be on the slide. And if you feel comfortable, would you recite this prayer out loud with me? Let's pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, We confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be. That we may do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen.